context a Christian response to terror? Will it be fear or faith? When fear over terrorism colors daily life, faith voices respond. And today we're beginning with an American perspective on both terrorism and the Christian response. Two people who have their pulse on that, Jonathan Merritt, a writer for the Atlantic Magazine and Religion News Service, and Chris Hewitts, an author, activist, and community leader with experience in over 70 countries, both join us from New York City. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us. Hey, thanks so much for having us on. Yeah, I appreciate oh, it. Okay, Jonathan, uh, we're going to start with taking a look at um, a, a certain variety of Christian response to terror. Take a look at this. If, if some of those people in that community center had had what I've got in my back pocket right now, that, <laughs> Is it, is it illegal to pull it out? I don't know. Is, is that... <laughs> anyway. That's in response to the San Bernardino shootings. That is the president of the largest Christian university in America. Jonathan, I want to ask, is that normative Christianity in the United States? Yeah, I don't know that it's normative Christianity, but it is normative if you're talking about a Liberty University type of Christianity. And so in, in that sense, as a Liberty alum myself, I'm, I'm disappointed in that, but I'm not surprised that they would respond to a shooting, not with uh, turning to grief, but turning to guns. If you know anything about the history of Liberty University, it was founded by Jerry Falwell, the senior, who was the founder of the religious right. You may remember he was the one who uh, said that, that gays, lesbians, abortionists, the ACLU were partly responsible for the 9-11 attacks. He said, I put my finger in your face. Yeah, but and he I later say, apologized, you this as did his son, sure, for remarks that were offensive to Muslims that continued in that clip. Totally. Yeah. If we, if we were to recount the controversial comments that have come from the Falwell family, we'd be here all night. The point, uh, the point is, is that Liberty University has been a place that has always been better at articulating a political vision for what it means to be a follower of Jesus than a, a theological vision for what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so in response to these comments, as Jerry Farnwell Jr. said, he did get support, but it was support from, as you've indicated, a particular type of Christian from a, a camouflage wearing, duck dynasty watching Christian in, in Mississippi okay. and not from Christian leaders and pastors. Okay, Chris Ewerts, um, I, I just want to put up a board that's been part of your work, and that says the strongest antidote to fear is to be present to the presence of God. And so here we are in a time of fear over terror. And, you know, my view is that the answer is not to be rallying troops around gun usage. Um, you've worked all around the globe. What is your idea on the current state of the soul, of the Christian soul in America? Well, I, I think that these notions of fear, and, and specifically as they relate to our notion of the divine, are, are rooted in, in, in all of our religious consciousness. So all around the world, in most of the, the world's religions, there is a, a built-in component of fear that uh, drives people. And I, and I ask folks frequently, like, if, if you love your idea of God so much that there's no promise of paradise or having no threat of, of punishment or hell, would you continue to be committed to your faith tradition? And you see, I think a lot of us make our faith options based on fear. And so what happens is that becomes sort of a muscle memory that we cultivate, that is nurtured within our religious communities. And then our faith leaders, when they peddle fear, are, 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 are speaking to sort of the socialization of how we've given ourselves to these traditions. And so I think this, this, this idea of being present to the divine as a way of dismantling fear, letting fear's control or grasp on us sort of dissipate is really the invitation. And I think uh, in, in, in the States right now, we've lost a, a sense of imagination for, 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 for rest and, and resting in these ideas of God, for, for, for consent, consenting to the nature of a God that is, is all loving and we've uh, given ourselves to a God that's become a fantastic abstraction. Okay. We've given ourselves to these images of God that, that really reflect more of the worst of us than the best of, 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 of who we could, could hope to become. Well, 
on that comment and on your idea of peddling fear, take a look at this. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. Where the hatred comes from and why we will have to determine. We're going to have to figure it out. We have to figure it out. We can't live like this. It's going to get worse and worse. You're going to have more World Trade Centers. It's going to get worse and worse, folks. We can be politically correct and we can be stupid, but it's going to get worse and worse. Okay, that is fear. That is fear speaking. Uh, Jonathan Merritt, when is that Trump train going to stop? Well, I, you know what? If I had a crystal ball, I would tell you. I, I, I don't know when that train will stop, but that train is moving, and it's moving fast. And there's a reason for it. And it's not just something located in the Christian movement, although if you look at the polls, Donald Trump has very strong support among certain sectors of Christians. There are more evangelicals, for example, say they support Donald Trump than any other presidential candidate running right now. But I think he's tapping into something that's more pervasive in American political life, is that people are fed up. They're fed up with the government. They're fed up with bureaucracy. They're fed up with inaction, with uh, political correctness, with what they consider to be uh, liberal media bias. And so what Donald Trump does is he gives a voice to their frustration. I think what when you talk about people of faith, uh, the question uh, gets a finer point on it, where they have to begin asking then, when you look at his answer for clarifying and for responding to that frustration, does it align with your values or not? And I think for a lot of people, not those who support Donald Trump, but for a lot of those, including myself, we say, no, I don't think that his vision aligns with the teachings of Jesus or the teachings of, of many other leaders within the great uh, world religions. Okay. Chris, we've got 60 million displaced people in the world today because of war. Where do you wish or hope or pray for the Christian imagination to be working politically on that problem? Well, I think we've, we've lost the ability to, to practice lament as a way of praying. And I think what Jonathan was just saying, um, some of this rhetoric that we see giving a, a voice to, to frustration or fear also exposes the poverty of our friendships. I, I think this poverty of friendships that a lot of us have, and, and especially uh, religious folks that, that, that allow for and that tolerate some of this really violent and I think um, dangerous rhetoric, perpetuates the possibility for, for displacement to, to become normalized. The, the so-called margins where these folks are suffering, it's at the so-called margins where, where, where displaced people are, are forgotten, uh, where, where we don't listen to their voices and we, and we fail to respond. We do have to conclude because of time, and I'm just thinking, let's wrap this up then on what would the Spirit of Jesus challenge us to be like as followers of Jesus, Christians, in, in this time of fears on terror? Sure, my, I, my sense is that if we could, in, in the states here, we've, I think we've lost a sense of imagination and we've, we've given that over to ambition. And this ambition is just a, a projection of our ego addictions that, that continue to, to dominate, that continue to divide, and that continue to exclude. And I think in, in the spirit of Christ and in, in the spirit of a God that loves us more than we want to be loved, uh, to make room allows for us to also be included and I, and I think that's really the invitation. I think that's really the correction that needs to take place here. Jonathan Merritt, what correction needs to take place? Well, I think he's, he is really, we, well, you've touched on a lot of it with fear language, and he's touched a lot uh, on, on a lot of this with inclusion language. You know, uh, followers of Jesus, we have this notion we call the incarnation, which is this idea that Jesus did not uh, just want to stay up in heaven and dictate what it looked like to to be in the image of God, but but to ca came and wrapped himself in flesh and walked among us. And that's, for us as Christians, that is a picture of what we should be doing, that we cannot keep people at arm's length. That's what creates fear. And I think that, that when we root ourselves in that notion of what it means to follow Jesus, we will start to see these issues, not just as problems to be solved, but as people to be loved. And we will realize that you cannot love your neighbor if you refuse to engage with your neighbor. All right. Well, much to watch in the days ahead. From New York City, Jonathan Merritt, author of Jesus is Better Than You Imagined, and Chris Hewitts, the author of Unexpected Gifts, Discovering the Way of Community. Thank you both for your insights today.
Our pleasure. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Today we're looking at a Christian response to terrorism. Our next guest has seen firsthand the tragic consequences of terrorism on families, children, and communities. Dr. Brian Stiller has traveled widely in the Middle East as a global ambassador for the World Evangelical Alliance. Please welcome Brian Stiller to Context. Brian, great to have you here, thank you. Wow, Brian, you, um, your blog, your emails from your world travels have always been landing in the inbox with just like, take a pause and really listen to what's coming here. What have you seen in your travels that has been caused by the war on ISIS? Well, you see within the Middle East, uh, in Southern Europe, the enormous tragedy of people who have been displaced by fear and by bombing, by beheading, by killing, by rumor. We do want to unpack this Christian understanding of how we respond to ISIS. It is both Islamic and it is not Islamic. Help me understand that. It is Islamic. ISIS? But many Muslims would say, I have nothing to do. Oh, of, of course, but many Christians would say, of another Christian group, I have nothing to do with them as well. ISIS is a 18th century Sunni, Saudi, Wahhabist revival movement that is attempting to move Islam back to the medieval pay period. And what they are trying to do is get all Christian influence out of the Middle East. And unfortunately, they equate everything North American, everything Western as Christian. What is the complication of putting a religious tag on cultures like but, that. But ISIS isn't just after Christians, it's after other Muslims who are Shia, those that don't agree with their particular narrow form of Sunni, Saudi, Wahhabist uh, uh, Islam. And so they'll kill the Shias, people who disagree with them. But of course, Christians are not only uh, infidels, but they represent the West and the West is evil. So there is a, there is at the very heart of ISIS, is to remove everyone from their caliphs, their territory that they dominate. They want to remove everyone from there who is, has, who is an infidel, and Christians, and those from the West certainly are. Okay, and now Christians have a chance to respond to this enormous global fear. What would you advise? Well, we, we've got two things at play here. One is the refugee crisis. And we are dealing with a tsunami of people moving like we've never had since the Second World War. 60 million. And those millions that are moving up from the Middle East and from North Africa are creating the problems and the issues in Europe that we, that, that we see. And Canadians are trying to make a modest response to it as well. So the first issue is how do we deal with refugees? How do we do, deal with this uh, historical movement of people that is changing the demographics of Europe and Middle East and of North Africa? And it's here that as I travel the refugee highway from, from Lesbos, the Greek island, uh, just off the Turkey coast and up into, into Europe, what I found everywhere, the agencies and the people that were caring for the refugees were Christians. And that's, that's intuitive. That's intuitive to our Christian response, to, to, our, to, our, to, our, to our message to the heart of the gospel, is to help people in need. And so the first response has got to be to help people in need. It isn't that we blind ourselves to the potential of terror. It isn't that we become uh, kind of dumb naive. about or naive about that as a reality, but to let that be the governing force, uh, A, it's contrary to the gospel. Fear and faith do not have the same place in our hearts. But secondly, we lose to the terrorists because what the terrorists are attempting to do is to create fear, and what fear does it either creates an irrational response or it emotionally immobilizes us. And, and so fear is, is both psychologically and spiritually dangerous. All right, and that's uh, on that good note of warning, Brian Stiller, thank you. Keep traveling, keep okay. looking uh, at those communities. Thank you for your book, An Insider's Guide to Praying for the World. And uh, we will stay tuned to your blogs and put a link up on how people can get connected to that. Brian Stiller is the Global Ambassador for the World Evangelical Alliance. Thank you for joining us. 
When we return, in the aftermath of terror, how conversions are becoming a challenge to Muslims. Little Jihadi Jr. was a chilling reminder that essential in ISIS ideology are conversions. Jr.'s grandparents confirmed to the media their daughter converted from belief in Christianity to Islam during her study at a London university. And in this war on terror, we can't ignore that core beliefs on what God requires of us are causing terrorist behavior. Well, it's not just terrorism wrestling for the House of Islam. Please welcome researcher and scholar David Garrison on how Muslims are encountering possibilities of conversion away from their faith. <laughs> David, thank you. Thanks very much for being with us. Wow, your book, um, A Wind in the House of Islam, has been a very interesting read for me. But historically, we have a terrible history on conversionism. Um, just help me understand what we should understand about the history between Islam and Christianity. Well, there's a long history. We go back uh, nearly 14 centuries uh, with Christianity interacting with the Muslim world, and it's been a history of conflict. Coercion. Uh, coercion on both sides. Uh, there's, uh, there's been a statement, I think is accurate, that Islam is the only world religion that was tailor-made to defeat Christianity. And quite frankly, it's been very effective over the years. Okay, but something historically very different is underway in Islam right now. Um, you've created this fascinating uh, study into the last many centuries, 14 centuries. Help me understand this graph that we're going to put up because you are documenting conversions at a completely brand new phenomenal level. What are we seeing here? Well, when I saw what was happening today, I was amazed by it. And I'm a church historian by training. And I was concerned that maybe I was just naive, that perhaps what we're seeing today has occurred at various times through history. So I went back to the beginning, uh, back to 622, the, the, the first pronunciation of the Islamic religion. I wanted to see when in history there had been Muslim movements of at least 1,000 Muslims baptized into the Christian faith. What I was able to discover was that when this happened, it was such an unusual occurrence that it, it, it made the news, it made history. So we were able to document when this happened in the 10th century, in the 13th century, and then the long, long drought of 500 years before it reappears at the end of the 19th century, two movements, and then the latter, latter one third of the 20th century, 11 more movements, and then what's happening today with okay. more than and 69 movements. And this is where you see movements. this big spike here. So in the last 12 years, in what you define as the nine rooms of Islam, you, you've seen 69 movements of, and describe again what a movement is. Well, we wanted to be real careful so we're not just talking about fans of Jesus. If you ask a room full of Muslims, do you like Jesus? You know, every hand will go up. We're talking about people who have been baptized. So when there's been at least a thousand baptisms over a, a two decade or less period of time, a thousand baptized in a, uh, baptisms in, in a Muslim community means these are people who are saying, I'm willing to die because of my faith in who Jesus is. I'm dying to an old life, I'm rising to a new life with Christ. So when there were at least a thousand, in some cases there were tens of thousands, Lorna, there were even in some cases more than a hundred thousand within a community. Uh, then we said something's going on here. This is noteworthy, this is historic. And what we found in the 21st century, as I finished my book, there were some 69 movements that we could clearly document and identify, each with at least a thousand baptized believers, something we've never seen in history. Uh, it is astonishing. You know, um, we went to Paris recently uh, after their terror attack and we found that mm -hmm. kind of phenomena in pockets there. Take a listen here to, uh, this is a Christian believer from a Muslim background explaining this in his own personal life. Take a listen. The day that I accepted Jesus Christ into my life, people around me saw that there had been a change in my life. I no longer wanted to drink. I no longer wanted to be involved with drugs or violence. I wanted to work and help other people around me. And the people around me, the young people in my district, they saw this transformation. I don't think it's so much about going out and trying to convert those around you, but just in being our true selves and being loyal to our beliefs, 
people will simply see that in you, and they will want to have the same positive change in their lives. I know over 50 young people who have come to know Christ and who have abandoned their institution view of religion for real, concrete faith, just from seeing that there had been a radical change in my life. Okay, hey David, that is the view from a conversion story yes. in Paris. Those, that's typical of what you're documenting in your 69 movements. And what's exciting, I was able to gather more than a thousand stories of Muslim background believers who have been baptized, come to faith, and each of them reports this sort of life transformation after an encounter with Jesus Christ. Okay, I want to bring up from our studio audience here, Haley, can you step step in here? Because, David, I want you to meet a Canadian who uh, is working with new immigrants, Haley McLeod, David Garrison. Come on in, have Thank a seat, you. Haley. Thanks, great to have you. You too. Um, Haley, you've heard this. You, you've changed your entire life so that you can, as a Canadian, live in one of the densest Muslim populated areas of our largest city. Are you seeing voices like David is speaking about or this man in Paris? We are. We are seeing people. Um, a lot of the people who come to us um, who want to follow Jesus are still secret believers. They haven't yet gone public with their faith. And we're seeing... Um, miraculous answers to prayer. Um, we're also seeing a lot of um, people from a Muslim background having dreams and visions of Jesus. And this is Canadian. This is made in Canada. That's what you're Absolutely. experiencing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. okay, David Garrison, global mm -hmm. researcher, 69 movements like that. What are the common threads? Well, uh, one of my friends uh, who works with 30 Days of Prayer for the Muslim World, uh, he asked me, he said, David, he said, how many of these movements in history have happened in the last 24 years? I said, well, I don't know. I never looked at that. And I did a little research and I said, oh my goodness, 82% of all the movements in 14 centuries have happened in the last 24 years. I said, well, why do you ask? He said, well, it was 24 years ago we began 30 days of prayer for the Muslim world. So mm -hmm. prayer has been a factor. The Word of God translated uh, into all these different languages of the Muslim world. That's been a factor. The ability to deliver it to them through uh, through video and audio and, and internet and satellite television. Yeah. These are things that weren't possible even uh, 20 years ago. Okay, Haley, give us your advice then. If this is the Canadian reality of uh, Christian Muslim relations mm -hmm. and neighborliness, how do we how do we how do we go forward with this? What would be your advice for myself as a Christian with Muslim neighbors? I think it's really important to have our hearts open to meeting a neighbor, a coworker, um, inviting them into your life, um, keeping your home open. Hospitality is so important for these cultures. So just inviting someone over for tea. Um, and when you do get those one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, share your personal story of how Jesus Christ has changed your life. Share how Jesus is working in your life right now because that's something they won't have experienced before. And the other thing um, when I have the opportunity is I ask my friends, can I pray for you in the name of Jesus? And when I pray for the problems that they're going through, in, in, uh, if, if my translator is with me, in their own language, um, in the name of Jesus, we see amazing answers to prayer, but we also see their hearts melt because someone is just caring enough about their life and about their problems to actually talk to God about them, um, it's not something they find in Islam. Their prayers are memorized and uh, not that, uh, and, and often in another language, right? And so that is part of the personal job of mm -hmm. just being a Canadian neighbor. Mm -hmm. Both of you, thank you very much. It's been fascinating. We've got a lot more on our website with David Garrison's material. And Haley, thank you for being with us. Uh, David Garrison, the author of Wind in the House of Islam. It's our choice for Lorna's books this week. You can win a free copy. Go to the website for that. And Haley McLeod, working in Toronto. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Coming up, two challenges for Christians and how we think about terrorism. Any large Canadian city and you are mindful of terrorism, Islamic Jihadi inspired terrorism. Its threat has deeply damaged the reputation of Islam. So on today's program we asked how should a Christian mind engage that kind of fear of terrorism and we heard two challenges. 
reach out to our Muslim neighbors and build friendships with them. And second, provide support to missions working to serve war victims and building peace. And we also learn from Dr. Garrison that the spirit of Jesus is actively at work in war zones and in Muslim communities. Dr. Brian Stiller, our guest who traveled to the refugee aftermath, wrote, when life was dangerous for the early church, the spirit reached out to a Roman soldier, Cornelius. Well, Cornelius was the enemy. And Brian reminded us it was by Cornelius working with a disciple, Peter, that the gospel was introduced to the world. We can assume that the spirit is at work in places and in ways known only to God. In time, we will read or meet those for whom even amidst deadly persecution, Jesus was at the center, bringing life in the most surprising ways. And more on Brian Stiller's interesting insights from the war zone on our website. But such hope cannot come soon enough as we move forward in the mandate to be peacemakers in a time of terror. For all of us, I'm Lorna Duick. Thank you for watching. Join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines. Thanks, everybody. You're very